All right, everyone, welcome back to the channel. In this video, we'll go through a high yield question and review of fetal heart tracings. So we'll do a question, go through the right, the wrong answers, and then a brief review of what you should be looking for when doing these questions and how to approach these on real exams. So we'll start with the question. A 30 year old G2P1 female at 39 weeks gestation presents for scheduled vaginal delivery. She has no significant past medical history um, prenatal follow-up has been regular with routine vaccinations and screenings. Vital signs include a temperature of 37, pulse is 95, blood pressure of 125 over 74, and respirations are 12. Physical exam is unremarkable. Fetal heart rate monitoring demonstrates moderate variability with no decelerations noted, but periodic accelerations of 20 beats per minute are noticed. Which of the following describes the most likely mechanism for the fetal heart accelerations? So we have parasympathetic response, fetal anemia, prolapse of the umbilical cord, maternal hemorrhage, fetal motion, or oligohydramnios. I'll pause here briefly if you want to walk through this on your own. Okay, so we'll work through the incorrect answers here first. So first, right off the bat, it's good to sometimes when you have this many options, lump some of the categories, some of the answer choices into which fit into similar categories. So for A here, we have parasympathetic response, and we know that some abnormalities in, fe in the fetal condition can cause a parasympathetic response, but that would cause a decrease in the heart rate due to the vagal stimulation. So we know that right off the bat, acceleration is not going to be explained by a parasympathetic response. Then we have fetal anemia, um, as well as maternal hemorrhage. Both of these we know could be caused by or lead to similar findings, um, maternal hemorrhage leading to fetal anemia and fetal anemia being the end goal here. Both of those we know that could potentially present with bradycardia, um, could be a sinusoidal pattern, but it's probably not gonna be acceleration. So we know that we can cross those off next. Next, we have prolapse of the umbilical cord. Um, we know that sometimes the, the cord can prolapse temporarily and can cause variable decelerations and also oligohydramnios, which is decreased total amount of the amniotic fluid, causes a similar compression of the umbilical cord. We know both C and F in this situation would lead to the same findings, which would be variable decelerations. And so we're left with fetal motion in this case. Important findings are there is that the physical exam was normal, moderate variability, no decelerations, and accelerations are all totally normal. This is a category one tracing, which we'll talk about here shortly. And so fetal motion was not supposed to be some ding, ding, ding alarm bell. It was more just supposed to keep you keep in mind that once you've ruled out all the other choices, you know that you're looking for something relatively benign or normal. Now let's talk about fetal heart tracing. So we have category one, two, and three, and just a general overview in general Category two is anything not in between one and three, and one and three are the important ones they want you to focus on. So category one um, has all of these features at the same time. So a heart rate of 110 to 160, so that's a normal fetal heart rate, different than a normal healthy adult um, with moderate variability, which shows that their heart rate is varying between six to 25 beats per minute, and that's a normal thing. Um, no lates or variables, and then early D cells or accelerations are both considered within the normal limits. And so this is what we saw on the previous question. So the relevance of category one tracing is that this is totally normal and there's no action to be taken. Category two is relatively simple for the sake of NVMe exams. They typically just want you to know that it's not one or three um, and that there's a potential increased risk of fetal acidemia. So you need to monitor this closely to see if it progresses to category three. And then category three is a few different options here. So the first thing is absent variability. So in contrast that with category one, which is moderate variability. So you wouldn't see much variation in the, the heart rate tracing. And one of these next three things, recurrent late decelerations, recurrent variable decelerations, or a heart rate of less than 110, which is really just fetal bradycardia, which that's the equivalent of fetal bradycardia. So absent variability in one of these three things is category three. Also by itself, a sinusoidal pattern is also category three, which often indicates fetal anemia. And these are all considered abnormal. And we'll talk about the management of these here in a little bit. So it's important to just generally know these categories because you generally know if you're looking at a normal tracing an almost abnormal or a totally abnormal tracing. And that's kind of what they want you to be aware of. So let's just talk about this tracing. And this is just to, to talk about what you would see in a normal tracing. So here at the top, you have the fetal heart rate, and here at the bottom, you have uterine contractions. If you think about each one of these big boxes as approximately one minute, you can generally kind of guesstimate what's going on in the flow of these tracings just by characterizing these over time. So these small, very, these small variations 
these small little waves. If you measure them, they're probably between six and 25. So that's the variability we're talking about. That's normal, moderate variability. These big spikes of looks like about 25-ish um, approximately would be accelerations in this case. Um, and oftentimes you can read into it by counting yourself, but you can also just kind of guesstimate that these are accelerations. Um, and then here are the contractions here at the bottom kind of regularly occurring every couple of minutes. Um, these first two happening more frequently than this third one here. Um, so the important things to note would be an early D cell would be a D cell that mirrors this, which we'll talk about later. So it would be an, a D cell that goes down right as the contraction is coming up and then it mirrors it in an upside down semicircle comes back up. That would be an early D cell. A late D cell would be you hit the peak of contraction here and then the D cell starts to happen. That's something you wanna watch out for because that would be a category three tracing and that's not a good thing. And then a variable D cell is different than either of the first two because it can be sharp looking. If you think of the V in variable, sometimes it looks like the tracing. It looks more V-shaped because it happens more rapidly than an early or a late D cell, which looks more like this contraction, a smooth hump, versus variables tend to look like that V because they're happening at a more accelerated pace. We'll talk about more of those in detail, but it's important to keep in mind what they look like because sometimes they may show you the picture of them. So the high yield mnemonic for these that most everyone has heard of is veal chop. And so variable decelerations, you think of cord compression, um, that's cord prolapse, cord compression, oligohydramnios, all of those can be related. Early decelerations, you think of head compression, accelerations are okay. So they're totally normal within category one. And then late decelerations is placental insufficiency and specifically utero placental insufficiency. So if you pair up each of these letters accordingly, the veal and chop, you can oftentimes keep the pathophys straight in your head and never have to remember which one is which. So that's why I've bolted these here. So we'll move on to talking about each of these. So variable decelerations, the mechanism here, we have cord compression leading to a brief period of fetal hypertension, a parasympathetic response, but because that's happening transiently and periodically, the cord being compressed, it happens, the D cell happens more rapidly and it's unpredictable when it will happen. So unlike an early deceleration, the timing is variable. So the timing is not gonna be related to contraction every time. It can be, but it won't always be. And then the other big thing you want to keep in mind is the onset to nadir, which is the bottom point, is less than 30 seconds. So it's rapid. Hence why it doesn't look like that upside down hump of the uterine contraction. It looks more like a V because a V, the descent is more rapid than a slow, gradual arch. And so that's another thing to keep in mind. So if it's intermittent, you can closely monitor, but anytime these are recurrent, you want to start with maternal repositioning. So specifically left lateral decubitus then you can progress to things like uh, resuscitative measures, IV fluids, oxygen administration, other things like that. And then an amnio infusion is oftentimes a third or fourth line treatment. And that's because if the cord is compressed because there's decreased amniotic fluid, example, the amniotic membranes have ruptured, um, you can't do an amnio infusion. But the am if the amniotic membranes are intact, you can inject amniotic fluid basically to re-volumize the amnion, which can help relieve this temporary cord compression. So that's high yield because that's different than late decelerations. But ultimately, if this doesn't improve, you would still have to progress to either a cesarean or a vaginal delivery, whichever is feasible depending on dilation status. So next we have early decelerations. The mechanism here, we have uterine contraction, especially if the fetal, fetus is in cephalic position, can lead to head compression and head compression would lead to a vagal response, almost like a baroreceptor reflex. And so these decelerations mirror the uterine contraction. So anytime you look for these, think of the deceleration with a perfectly mirrored image of the uterine contraction. That's what you're looking for with the early deceleration. And so the onset to the bottom point is 30 plus seconds. So it's gradual. Unlike the V shape you may see in a variable deceleration, it'll be a gradual, looks exactly like the contraction, but flipped upside down. And these are often, often normal. And so you usually don't need any intervention with these early decelerations. Contrast that with variable D cells. Now we have accelerations, which are okay. So these are fetal motion and other normal changes in fetal activity leading to acceleration. So if you think about a, a fetus moving around, heart rate is just gonna increase just periodically as the blood supply increases are needed. Um, so the findings here are an increase in fetal heart rate greater than 15 beats per minute for 15 seconds, but less than 10 minutes. Greater than 10 minutes would just be fetal tachycardia at that point. And then two accelerations within a 20 minute period is a reactive 
fetal heart tones, that is what you may see in a non-stress test. If you think about what a non-stress test is, it's basically seeing if you're seeing these normal accelerations and seeing if they're reactive. And otherwise you may need to progress through your resuscitative measures. And so these just like early's oftentimes don't require any intervention. Hence why these are both in category one and variable recurrent variables and lates are in category three. And then last here, we have late decelerations um, caused by utero placental insufficiency. And so what this means is that there's essentially insufficiency of the placenta leads to this transient fetal hypoxia, which leads to decreased heart rate, but it occurs after the contraction. The contraction can sometimes cut off the oxygen, which leads to this deceleration, but it's not directly coinciding with a vagal response to the contraction itself. That's why it's delayed. So instead of a perfect mirror where the heart rate dips right as the contraction goes up, the contraction goes up and then later the deceleration happens. So it's a little bit delayed. So the findings are a delayed deceleration from the uterine contraction. It's not a mirror image, which is completely different than an early decel. And then very much like an early decel, the onset is gradual, um, but it's different than a variable, which would be rapid. So if you are trying to decide if there's something pathologic and you don't know if it's a variable or a late, Go look for the small one minute boxes and see if this is happening with less than 30 seconds, you know it's a variable deceleration. It can trick you sometimes because variables can sometimes occur just coincidentally at the same time as a contraction. But if it's less than 30 seconds, you know it's a variable. And if it's more than 30 seconds, you know it's a late deceleration. So you treat these usually with resuscitative measures. So you try maternal repositioning, you then try maternal IV fluids and oxygen administration. But since this one is not due to oligohydramnios cord compression, you would not attempt amnio infusion. You would progress to whatever emergent delivery would be feasible at the time. Oftentimes on exams, it'll be a cesarean delivery because they won't be fully um, dilated at that point. So those are the major types, but we have some other high yield fetal heart tracings here. So the sinusoidal pattern, which we didn't see a picture of, but it looks very much just a steady low up and down like a sinusoid. And so that's indicative of fetal anemia. And so that's the high yield finding they want you to know with fetal anemia. Fetal tachycardia, so if they're persistently 170 beats per minute or more, um, you think of hypotension, which means the fetus is requiring increased heart rate to continue their oxygen perfusion. Maternal fever or choreo are both infections, and infections almost always cause tachycardia. So that's another place you can find fetal tachycardia. Fetal bradycardia um, can occur with maternal IVC compression, you know, as the uterus becomes more enlarged, with, as the uterus becomes gravid. When laying supine, the uterus can compress the IVC, decrease venous flow, and so on and so forth, cause bradycardia. Um, congenital CNS abnormalities and hypoxia can also cause bradycardia. Um, so you want to keep these in mind when you think of tachycardia and bradycardia. So sometimes it's not just the tracings, the categories themselves, but the rate can be high or low, and they want you to be aware of what things can cause that. So if you generally remember which ones are category one, which ones are category three, your high yield mechanisms that causes everything and you can keep that straight with veal chop. And then if you remember the basic steps in management, it oftentimes follows what the pathological problem is. And if you keep these things in mind, um, fetal heart tracings will the vast majority of the time be much more approachable. Um, so drop a like and subscribe if you found this content helpful and we'll be sure to do more like this in the future.